Okay, as I mentioned before, I'm Rhonda Miller. I'm at Utah State University, and I'll be presenting um, part of the results of a larger study that we're doing at Utah State, where we're looking at ways to improve our grazing systems. Now, you might be wondering why we want to be worried about our grazing systems. We actually have, dairy is a big and, and an important industry in Utah, and we also have a lot of smaller dairies, especially up in northern Utah. Just in general, there's a lot of dairy production in the Western US, and we're seeing a lot of increase in that organic milk production. Organic milk production requires that the animals graze at least 120 days a year, at least in our area. And it requires that a minimum of 30% of the dry matter intake be from pasture over the, an average of that grazing period. Now, when we look at that though, the, you think that's all wonderful. You don't have the cost for baling and harvesting feed and things, but we're also seeing that the dry matter intake is generally reduced. And typically, especially for um, a lot of our milky lactating cows, if they're on a primarily forage diet, 75 or more percent of their diet is from forage, we're seeing 30% or more of their milk production drop or dropping their milk production. And that makes that balance seem not so good because you can save money on the harvest costs, but if you're losing a lot of your milk production, you have to have a pretty good premium to help make up a lot of that. So part of that, we're looking at ways to help improve that forage production. We also have been seeing years where we have fertilizer prices increase tremendously like this year. So even if you're a conventional farmer, not an organic farmer, purchasing that inorganic fertilizer can be really expensive. So what we're doing is we want to try and find different ways to have grazing systems where we can improve, have really good rates of gain and improve those rates of gain, improve that dry matter intake, maximize our forage production and the economical return. We realize that our organic fertilizers are expensive. So oftentimes they're not, our producers are not adding as much nitrogen fertilizer as you may want. But we also wanna look at protecting the groundwater as we're doing these systems. Now you might wonder why we're worried about groundwater in a grazing system. It seems like that perfect little Norman Rockwell setting, right? We have beautiful little cows or heifers out grazing into this lush green pasture. What could be wrong with that? They're picking up nutrients from across that pasture and they're depositing those nutrients back on the pasture. Should be perfect, but it's not actually because when you start to look at where that deposition is, those urine and fecal spots only cover about 10% of that pasture in a year. So 90% of your pasture gets no fertilizer and they kind of tend to like the same spots. So they like to be around the waters and things like that. So some spots will get a lot of fertilizer, other spots won't get any. Also, when we look at those spots, the urine spots especially are problematic. Within a urine spot, the nitrogen content can be equivalent to a thousand pounds of nitrogen per acre. Now it's just in that little spot, but a thousand pounds of nitrogen per acre is way more than any of our plants can ever utilize. So what happens to it? Some of it volatilizes. Um, urine is full of urea, which rapidly converts to ammonia. So some is volatilized. And then a bunch of it leaches on through. So you're hoping you have a plant system that can utilize and intercept as much as possible, but a thousand pounds is more than any of our plants are going to use. So we theoretically should be getting lots of leaching out of those urine spots. Um, our feces are a little more friendly. It's in more in an organic form and it takes longer for that to be released. And also in the case of cows, we can actually go break up those cow pies and help distribute some of those nutrients. The other reason we wanted to look at this is that we know that there's the potential for future regulations on these grazing operations. Back when we were doing the Utah strategy a while ago, our EP, Region 8 EPA was actually really pushing for our, our region, for Utah to be putting in some grazing regulations. Currently grazing operations are exempt from the afo CAFO regulations, but they were really pushing for that. We didn't end up putting any of them in there, but that was kind of a good little wake up call that that's on their radar screen. And even though we've gotten a reprieve for the last few years, I would guess that it will likely reappear on that radar screen again at some point. And so we wanted to be able to have data 
that shows you know, whether our grazing operations are, are good and not harming the environment or which ones work well and which ones don't, but at least have some data, not just have regulations imposed randomly on us. So we did a previous study with beef steers, and this was really mostly in response to the fertilizer costs where we just looked at tall fescue, which is a really high forage production grass. And we looked at adding in legumes to help reduce the cost of the fertilizers. In this study, it was an inorganic fertilizer we were using. It was just a conventional system. We added in alfalfa and bird's foot trefoil. And then we had tall fescue with nitrogen fertilizer and then tall fescue without nitrogen fertilizer. No surprise, tall fescue without fer nitrogen fertilizer does abysmal. But but our tall fescue bird's foot trefoil actually had the highest rates of gain and did better. We actually thought the alfalfa would do better, but the bird's foot trefoil mix did better. Here's just a quick summary of some of it. Um, do we have a laser? The crude protein jumps up um, more than just the tall fescue with the nitrogen, which is to be expected. Our legumes have a good high crude protein average. What we did see though, is we got an, the highest average rate of gain was with the tall fescue bird's foot trefoil, but we also had the highest stocking density with our bird's foot trefoil. When we looked at the economics, and this is really what we're, our main goal was, we were getting a return of $484 per acre with the tall, tall fescue bird's foot trefoil versus $100.92 with just the tall fescue with fertilizer. So that means that economically our legumes can do wonders for us, especially if our fertilizer prices are, are expensive. So the other thing that we looked at though, our animal scientists on the group, they were looking at the net energy and they went, hmm, we're losing net energy. We don't have enough energy in that feed for those cows. And we, so they hypothesized that if we put in a high energy grass, a high sugar grass and used our birds for, birds for trefoil, that we should be able to improve our rates of gain for the, for the process. So our big objectives are to improve our forage yield, reduce our fertilizer costs, basically improve our economics. We're looking at our livestock gains. We're also looking at the environmental impacts. And then as part of this, when we increase the nitrogen in their diet, we have that potential to shift or alter their reproductive development. So we also had scientists looking at that to make sure that we weren't negatively affecting their reproductive development. The materials and methods, we had four grasses that we looked at, our tall fescue again, meadow brome grass, it's one we like in Utah a lot, a high sugar orchard grass and a high sugar perennial rye grass. We had those four grasses with bird's foot trefoil. And then we also had a control, so a TMR, total mixed ration diet, out at the cane dairy, cane dairy where we kept them. So they were kept inside, but with a total mixed ration. For the fertilizer, the grass monocultures got Chilean nitrate at 25 pounds in April. Our grass, mono, our grass legume mixtures also got the Chilean nitrate in April. We then added feather meal, a real slow release nitrogen fertilizer source at the rate of 31 pounds per acre later in the spring. And then another dose of Chilean nitrate in July on the grass monocultures. We're in Utah, we have to irrigate all the time. So we irrigated every two weeks. And we had these out at the Lewiston Intermountain Pasture Facility. So we have these nice um, paddocks. We have nine acre pa pastures. We had three of those that we had for this study. We had the eight treatments divided among those in each of those paddocks. And then each treatment or bigger pastures each of those treatments was divided into five paddocks. We used rotational grazing and we used a rotational grazing system of rot being on one paddock for seven days and moving to the next one. So every little paddock had a 28 day rest period. At the end of each grazing cycle, we took all the heifers up, we weighed them, evaluated them, made sure that they were doing well. We took urine, fecal and blood samples and a bunch of other data too. Um, our fecal samples were just grab samples. It's always a favorite for everyone. Um, those we analyzed with the combustion analyzer for total nitrogen. The urine samples is by the tickle method. I don't know if you've gotten to experience that. That's its own little level of fun. And those we, we also analyzed, but we analyzed them for the urea nitrogen on a latchet. 
And we took blood samples and those were analyzed for blood urea nitrogen. For the leachate out in the field, we, in one of those nine acre pastures, we had previously installed zero tension lysimeters. These are 15 inch diameter by 44 inch deep soil cores that we extracted intact, put on a collection system, and then dropped them back down where we pulled them from. And then up here, you can see we've cut around, it's just held with duct tape. We put them back into the soil and then we remove that top portion. So we've been able to plant and retill over those zero tension lysimeters for years now. And it's great because you don't have to be doing stuff. There's the MPEX tubing that runs down from the bottom of those lysimeters all the way up to the trailer and up into the trailer where we put a vacuum pump on and collect the leachate. The beauty of these is we can collect leachate all year round. So even if we can't get out to the field, the co collection system has enough capacity that we can collect all of that leachate. We also, just to get some more replications, put in some suction cup lysimeters. These have to be, have a vacuum put on them every week and we collect the leachate every week. These have the drawback of that they, we cannot collect leachate during the winter months. And from previous studies, I have seen that we get some pretty good flushes of nitrates with our snow melt in the spring. And oftentimes we can't catch those on the, the suction cups. The results, our average daily gains, our perennial ryegrass actually beat out the to total mixed ration by one pound uh, average. But so those are just right neck and neck. But if you look at it, the monocultures in blue were always lower performing than the grass legume mixtures. Now, not entirely surprising because our grass legume mixtures have a higher crude protein content. So we kind of expect that. Um, when we start looking at the nutrient cycling and what happens to those nutrients in the urine, again, we see our grass legume mixtures have a lot more urea in their urine. So this is a bad sign because that's exacerbating the potential nitrogen that can be coming through and leaching. And again, our grass legume mixtures always were higher than the monocultures and not surprising. It wasn't that far off from the total mixtration. So some of our grass legume mixtures were a little bit lower. So it's really fairly similar to the TMR. The fecal nitrogen, the TMR actually had a higher nitrogen level. And, but again, our grass legume mixtures were higher. I'm already, okay, we're good. Higher in the total nitrogen content than the monocultures. The blood urea nitrogen follows a similar trend. Again, not necessarily surprising. And when we look at the leaching, this is the fun part. And I'm only gonna present the zero tension lysimeters, but we have, for the most part, our grass legume mixtures are lower in leaching, nitrogen leaching than the grass monocultures. This seems backwards. We were not applying that much nitrogen to the monocultures, so you wouldn't think there'd be a lot of leaching out of those monocultures. We know we have more nitrogen in the system as evidenced in their blood urea nitrogen, the feces and the urine, and yet we're seeing less nitrogen leaching in those grass legume mixtures. When we look by grass, there's definitely a difference by grass. Tall fescue is a little super scrounger. It pulls up everything. It, and in a previous study, it had done that too. Perennial ryegrass was our worst in this case. Um, and the meadow brome and orchard grass are probably really pretty similar. In a previous study, Orchard grass was the one who had failed miserably. The soil types are totally different. This is a sandy soil. The previous study where orchard grass failed and had the highest nitrogen leaching, that was a heavy, heavy, heavy clay soil. And so it may be just a matter of how much those roots, how far deep those roots can grow. And we've got some root cages out there to look at some of that root growth. And in summary, um, our, we can add in the legumes and we can get good rates of gain matching basically our total mixed ration rates of gain in many cases. Um, the average daily gain is affected by the forage species. And we always were getting better average daily gains when we used a grass legume mixture than a monoculture. So we can see that we can add in those legumes. We increase the protein content of the forage. We do see increased fecal nitrogen and urine nit urea nitrogen which could have potential negative consequences, but it appears that we're actually able to capture that having those grass legume mixtures. We think that this is most likely a matter of the rooting systems, that there's two species, 
that have two different root patterns growing in. And those two different species will also support different microbial populations. And those different microbes will also pull up nitrogen and retain it at, at different levels. And having, we think that having the broader variety of microbial species may be contributing to that also. And with that, I conclude my presentation and thank you for your time. We have like four minutes left. We can do like one question quick while they pull up the next one. Oh. Oh, sorry. Um, no, it actually had no effect on the reproductive development at all. So we were doing heifers, dairy heifers in this study, and they were doing ultrasounds and stuff, and it appeared to have zero effect. So we're good on that front. So right now everything looks really good. The initial analyses for economics, the grass legume mixture by far outshines the monocultures. I have a question for you. Okay. Um, the um, the lysimeters mm -hmm. um, are you are you just capturing water at the bottom liquid water and it's it's like a pan that you're pumping out um yes yeah, so the, yeah the water flows through I've got a microphone so the water flows through the lysimeter the soil and then you know at about four feet deep it we have a screen and stuff so and then the water drops into a, a reservoir and then we pump that, that leachate out and analyze it. So it's all gravity flow. So it's just like it would be in the, in the field normally. It's, there's, cause we're just pulling from the reservoir and not, we're not putting a big vacuum on it. And how, uh, how often would you collect samples? We collect samples pretty much um, every two weeks during the summer. And then during the winter, we usually have two, three months where we can't collect any. And how many of these would you, have in a field. Mm -hmm. This is, this is for my, my own personal mm -hmm. use. I have 32. They're kind of a pain to put in. <laughs> and, and do they show lots of variability in the results or within I, what you would consider the I, same I think, treatment? I think, no, I think they're pretty consistent with it. Yeah. I, I'm really happy with them. I just don't like installing them. So. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so there, on those, we've removed the top 14 inches of the PVC pipe. So that whole core went in intact with the PVC pipe. The top 14 inches is just open so we can till. And then that core remains like it was down below 14 inches. Mm -hmm.